So we've gotten to the Aegean, and I always like to start with a map. Uh, so we're doing that, and you can see where the Aegean is located. We're basically talking about the sea um, between Turkey and Greece, modern-day Turkey and Greece, and the area, um, the land that is in that area as well. And by the way, um, in this class, we're calling the Aegean um, the times that are before the ancient Greeks. Um, so we don't quite have like a Greek language at this time. But later on, we're actually going to be talking about the exact same land areas, uh, and it will be um, the ancient Greeks. Um, so we'll kind of understand how that works as we go along. Uh, so this is the area we're talking about, uh, the modern Aegean Sea, um, and the um, island of Crete specifically is what we're going to talk about. Um, so the people that are now known as the Minoans, um, we don't know what they called themselves, uh, on Crete. And the peak was about 1600 to 1400 BCE. Um, and we're not exactly sure uh, what led to their downfall. Uh, there's a lot of historical theories um, that we don't have to get into in this class and one geological theory. Um, but I can give you a few more details later on, but not super important for understanding what we need to understand. So the Minoan civilization, uh, we have evidence going back to about 3000 BC. Uh, and then um, after the peak, they kind of stuck around until about 1100 BC. Uh, and the culture was basically forgotten. Um, it was mentioned by, by some people like the ancient Egyptians, but uh, it wasn't something that people thought about. Um, until the 19th century. And Sir Arthur Evans, who was one of those, and I'll put up the air quotes, gentleman scholars. Uh, back then, you didn't have uh, archaeologists that were professionally trained like you do now. Um, and this guy had some money, <laughs> uh, which is what you had to have to be able to do this sort of job back then. Uh, and he was inspired by Greek myths like the Iliad. And some people at the time thought, when they looked at mythology, they saw, well, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that aren't true, like monsters and such, but that mythologies are based on some historical um, happenings. Uh, and they just kind of like embellished it for the purpose of telling the story. And generally, I should mention, by the way, like the uh, way that historians and art historians uh, and literature historians define mythology isn't something, a story that's not true. Instead, what a mythology is, is the story of a people. So you may have things in it that you don't find believable, like magic or you know gods or monsters or whatever, um, but it can also have a his true historical basis. Uh, so mythology um, does not imply truth or lack of truth. It just means a story of a people from their perspective um, what they want to communicate about themselves and what they believe in. So uh, when he saw these um, areas on Crete, and we'll kind of talk about why, he named the civilization after Minos, um, and that is from uh, Greek mythology. Uh, the stories in Greek mythology are written down much later, um, but most historians nowadays consider them to be um, kind of oral stories that were told, so about 750 BC or so this, this story was being told. So Crete is the home of Minos, uh, the son of Zeus and the mortal Europa. So if you know anything about Greek mythology, you know Zeus uh, just loves some mortals <laughs> and it was always trying to hook up with them and have babies with them all the time. Uh, and we'll see some more of that a little bit later on in the class when we get to Rome. So uh, Minos, by the way, people in Europe usually pronounce it Minos. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, broke promise to broke a promise to Poseidon, and caused Europa to fall in love with a bull. Uh, so Poseidon is is the god that is generally pretty vindictive, uh, and the god of the sea. Uh, so the Minotaur is the result of this particular union. So every year the Minotaur would demand. Uh, to be able to eat seven girls and seven boys sent from Athens as a tribute. Otherwise, he would go um, and destroy the whole city. Um, so our hero, sort of, Theseus, killed the Minotaur in the labyrinth and was rescued by Minos' daughter, uh, Ariadne. Uh, so, 
So how he paid her back is typical Greek mythology style. They escaped the Naxos. Uh, and Theseus leaves Ariadne, even though she was the one that gave him an idea on how to make his way out of the labyrinth. Uh, and he wouldn't have survived otherwise. Um, so he leaves her, you know, he's very thankful, returns to Athens. Uh, and um, what he was supposed to do um, when he was on the boat returning to Athens was to have a signal that let his father know um, that he was all right. But he forgot that. And um, in the story, it's kind of implied that Poseidon made him forget it. Um, his father, um, King Aegis, uh, sees that the signal isn't there and assumes that his son was uh, killed by the Minotaur. Uh, so Aegis throws himself into the sea. Uh, so I think the moral of this story is don't mess with Poseidon. <laughs> uh, and if you read Greek, Greek mythology, you'll see that's often the case. Uh, so he was inspired by this story uh, and, you know, kind of named the culture he found on Creek after, after um, this story. But again, we don't know what they call themselves. So Evans believed that the word labyrinth at the time meant house of the double axe. Uh, and he found a bunch of representations throughout the palace. But the ancient Greeks, what they meant was a maze. Uh, so what might have happened is the ancient Greeks saw the ruins of this particular palace and thought, look at this, this is like a maze. Uh, and you can see from the part that's been, parts that have been um, excavated so far, just a bunch of rooms and, and things leading in all different directions and narrow corridors. Uh, so it would certainly seem like a maze um, if the ancient Greeks had, had come in and seen that. So it was unfortified, uh, and some of the historians have tried to interpret that as saying, oh, they were a peaceful culture, um, but that's highly doubtful. Uh, most cultures that become wealthy, they don't do so uh, by being peaceful. Um, they have to protect uh, their wealth, and, and they're usually driven to expand their wealth, and that means uh, armies, and in the case of the Minoans, a uh, good navy, uh, but they didn't need fortifications because they're on an island. Uh, it's really difficult to attack someone on an island. You can get them while they're out at sea. So, uh, you know, if you see some stories about the peaceful Minoans, we, we have a ton of evidence to say that the, that indeed was not the case. So the palace at Knossos, uh, which is a modern day name for this place, is brightly painted uh, inside and out. And there are some restorations on, on the palace that are done, giving an idea of what it originally looked like. Uh, this reproduction gives you an idea of what, what it may have looked like at the time. Um, this clothing is what we see in the art. It's not necessarily what people wore at the time. We're not sure. Uh, the tapering columns they have are really unique. <clears throat> you often see columns that taper uh, in the opposite direction with the, with the um, fat part at the bottom and then skinny part at the top. Uh, but this type of taper uh, is, as far as we know, unique. Uh, so this is obviously with the paint, uh, is a modern reproduction with the paint, uh, but it is going on the old columns. Uh, so it's just to give people an idea when they visit the site uh, what it originally would have looked like. And inside of the palace, there are a bunch of paintings. Uh, and they're a particular kind of painting, and that's why we still see them today. Uh, it's a fresco painting, um, but specifically Buon fresco, uh, which is often called true fresco. Uh, so a fresco painting is just another way of saying a wall painting. And the easiest way to do a wall painting is to take a dry wall and paint on it. But when you do that, depending on the type of paint you use, uh, eventually the paint's going to fall off the wall unless you have some miracle of preservation like we saw with the cave paintings. So if you want a painting to last, you have to do it in a different way. And Buon Fresco, which literally means um, good fresco, uh, what they do is the artists uh, lay down some plaster on the wall in a small section, and they paint into the wet plaster. And when they do, um, a chemical reaction takes place as they're painting and as the plaster is drying, and the paint becomes part of the wall. So it's more like what you would see with a ceramic and a glaze uh, where it's fired together. So instead of the paint sitting on top of the wall, uh, it's part of the plaster. 
the plaster can break off the wall, and that's why you see all these pieces here. Uh, but you can just pick it up and put it back on the wall because the color will last. Uh, so, you know, all of the paintings that we're going to look at that still survive from this point on are all going to be Buon Fresco. And I'll post a video that'll explain how this is done in the comments for this video. Uh, so one of the reasons why um, the people that are originally digging it up, like Sir Arthur Evans, uh, might have associated with the Minotaurs because there's a bunch of paintings and sculptures of bulls. And this one, it's called the Toreador fresco. And the reason why that's in quotes is because it just in Toreador just means bullfighter. But we don't actually know what this is all about. Uh, the Minoans wrote, um, and we can't read the script um, that they used uh, for writing about everyday things. Um, one of the scripts they used is has some mathematical notation in it and that that's readable but the other stuff isn't so we're not sure what they were doing with this and all we can get out of it is reading the pictures but we do know a couple of things um, just like in ancient egypt we see that there is a composite um, kind of style so we see the eyes are seen from the front and then the body and profile we also see conventions for men and women uh, so men are shown with darker skin and women are shown with lighter skin. Again, this doesn't reflect reality. It's just a convention. Uh, so these are both female figures. Uh, and we have this one right here. There's a lot of sculptures and sometimes they'll call it the bull leaper. Uh, and there's even speculations you can find from uh, serious scientists trying to figure out if this is how exactly this person got into this position. So that's kind of interesting. But one thing you'll notice about this uh, that's different than what we see in Egyptian art is that it's in time, it's dynamic. So remember most of the Egyptian art we saw with the exception of Akhenaten, uh, we see the pharaohs and other elite people as being timeless. Uh, they're stiff, they're not in motion. So the Minoans are doing something much different. We're seeing something that's like literally a split second in time uh, and we're not necessarily seeing people that are elite or anything like that. Uh, they seem to be uh, regular people. And we're seeing them um, in this like kind of like perhaps an athletic contest or something along those lines. So the cool thing about fresco is that if you want to change the painting, you can just put another layer of plaster up, paint into that, and you're set. Uh, what's even cooler is if you're an archaeologist uh, and you're digging this stuff up, uh, when one layer cracks off, like we can see with these rosettes to these swirly ones, <clears throat> both layers of paint will be preserved. And you can see what people had done previously. So like everything else we looked at, even the name of the people Minoans, uh, when you see the names of some of the rooms in this palace, they don't reflect necessarily what the M Minoans thought. And in this case, I'm, I'm almost certain that it doesn't reflect what the Mo Minoans thought. Um, Megaron just literally means room. Uh, and that says the queens, it means literally a big room. Uh, and it says the queens Megaron. So what people had done early on, um, modern archaeologists wouldn't do this. So they said, look, that's the biggest room. So we'll call that the the king's Megaron, uh, and then the second biggest room, we'll call that the queen's Megaron. We don't even know if the Minoans had kings and queens or, or that type of leadership. Um, but what's kind of cool is you're seeing again moments in time, this time with animals, so with dolphins, uh, but it doesn't have that kind of like timeless effect that you would see um, with the ancient Egyptians. So some of the things that are found uh, in these Minoan digs are kind of unknown what they're all about and pretty unique at the same, same time. So there's a couple of these around. Uh, sometimes it's called a snake goddess or priestess. Again, we can't read the writing, so we don't know what it was all about. But you can kind of take some looks at it and think, hmm, uh, perhaps there is something special about this particular figure. Uh, you can see that she has her eyes really wide open. Uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, which is, is um, the area that, that is modern-day Iraq, uh, many figures who were shown as praying would have this wide open eyes and these arms up like this. So perhaps that has something to do with it. 
Um, the clothing she's wearing is fancy, uh, but it's standard for the time. So all the paintings we see women have their breasts exposed uh, and have dresses like this. Hers is just fancier. Uh, same thing with her headgear. She's holding a couple of snakes. Uh, and if you're looking at this from a modern perspective, if you, or if you have a background in Abrahamic cultures, uh, so like Islam or Christianity, uh, you may think of snakes as being evil, um, but uh, most cultures didn't necessarily look at that. Uh, many cultures associated snakes with agriculture because they dig holes in the ground. That's what you have to do to plant. Uh, so we can't look at this and assume that it means evil. But uh, she does seem pretty powerful. Look at the way she's holding up her arms, uh, you know, straight out in front of her, almost about to make the double biceps pose as a weightlifter. Uh, and she seems to be handling these snakes uh, fairly easily. And then on top of her head, she has a cat. And if any of you own a cat, um, you may like contrast those to dogs. Like dogs want to please you. They want to do tricks for you. Uh, they basically live through you. Uh, cats aren't like that. Uh, they're almost uncontrollable. Uh, so many cultures looked at cats as being like particularly powerful or human-like, or um, in this case, uh, previous students in this class had speculated, well, maybe it's showing just how much power she has and that she can control uh, a house cat. So again, we don't know what it means exactly, but uh, it is interesting. And it's made out of faience, which is that glass, glassy type of ceramic uh, that we had seen for the eyes in ancient Egypt. When you get in a little bit closer, uh, you can see, I know it looks like a dog sometimes here, but it is a cat. Um, and it's just interesting to see uh, what the figure is. Perhaps these patterns have some meaning. Um, again, we don't really know. So after the Minoans started the fall, uh, we saw some other cultures uh, who started to rise up on the, what is today the mainland of Greece. Uh, the Mycenaeans are one of them. And they become dominant from 1400 until about 1200 BCE. Uh, and it seems to be all throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, so going from what's the modern day Middle East uh, all the way to Spain uh, and also including North Africa, that a lot of cultures seem to fall around 1200, 1100 BC. Uh, and again, for the purpose of this class, it's not necessary to understand uh, why that is, uh, but you can look it up and maybe put something on the, the um, extra credit board. If you, if you uh, Google Bronze Age Fall or something like that, uh, you'll find some information on it. So this culture, j judging on their art, by their art, has very militaristic values. Uh, and most people speculate that Homer's soldiers uh, in, in the mythology that sacked Troy may have been based on the historical Mycenaeans. Uh, 